This is what Nebuchadnezzar did. We got our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. They ravished the women in Zion and the maids in the cities of Judah. Princes are hung up by their hand. The faces of elders were not honored. They took the young men to grind, and the children fell under the wood. The elders have ceased from the gate, the young men from their music. The joy of our heart has ceased. Our dance has turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe unto me that we have sinned. Jeremiah says it's because we have sinned. Speaking on behalf of Israel. And Jeremiah did it. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar. And and yet God was able to humble him. He used him to humble Israel. Bring them to their knees. And then God says, I, I can deal with him. And he humbled Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. So I, I, I don't doubt that uh, God put the president there in view of the judgment that are coming. And therefore, to uphold him, not because it's what he's, what he's doing, but in spite of it. Mm-hmm. If perchance God would have mercy mm-hmm. in the time of his wrath. But the prophets... It's the prayer of the prophet, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. And when he went to see Clinton, he says, Mr. Clinton, when I heard of your policies, he says, I was totally shocked. God told me to give you a message. Now, Rick Joyner, I think it's very probable that he puts it all together and and interprets it, you know, in a way that maybe is wrong. And there's a danger in doing that, I think. When the prophecy comes forth, I don't think we should get together and try and figure it out or analyze it too much. Because when it happens, it's generally very different to what we imagine, you know. So, I mean, I don't, I know we're going to have real trouble up where we are too. I mean, I can see it brewing. Prophet whom I recognize as a, a valid prophet said there's a holocaust coming for Canada. And I couldn't see how it could happen when it came forth, but I can see it now. There's just such uh, unrest. One province wants to separate. It's like as if California and Oregon decided we're going to separate. You know the, the effect it would have on the whole country. And the Native people want self-government, and in places where they've had a taste of self-government, it generally hasn't worked. It's been a lot of suffering, and many of the Native people don't want it, but they're listening to the leaders, and, and I can see how trouble can brew there. But God's got a strong Native church in Canada, and in the States. There's a strong Native church. And uh, I believe God's going to move mightily along. I just take it for granted there's great trouble coming in this yes. nation and yes. as well as in ours. And as this prophet said, dig deep and hide in the rock because God will have a place for his people in that time. Yes. We talk about, you know, the church doesn't get raptured right away. It goes through the tribulation, becomes a doctrine and almost Sometimes it becomes a doctrine like, no, I believe in pre-tribulation. No, I don't. I believe we're going through it. And so it's a doctrine. If we know we're going through trouble, we better be sure that... I don't mean to be survivalist in any sense of the word. Because God's disciples are not survivalists. Trying to survive, trying to run to the mountain and, and dig a hole in the rock and and store up food and water. Uh, I mean, God's disciples do what God says. And if he says, stay here in Huntsville, when there's a danger of being blown up, you stay. But by the same token, if you're walking with God, he could say some evening, get in your cars and go somewhere. And we've got to have that communion with God. We can hear his voice. 
Yeah. Our safety is not in our armaments, and God's going to demonstrate that to this powerful nation. As he demonstrated in Soviet Russia. That just almost overnight the thing collapsed. In its present form, we don't know it could it could rise up again as a, a threat to the world. And here they are in great trouble. And we look on and it's a it's a point of interest to see what's going on there. But you ever imagine that things like that could happen here? But uh, I think of Jeremiah, you know, warning and warning and warning the people and, and refusing to repent. And, and then the elders come to him and, and they sat before him to inquire of the Lord. Jeremiah says, I won't be inquired of by you. The elders of Israel. God's complaint in America it's not with the judicial system or with the president any of these governors God puts them there I don't care your vote I've said that many times and I know people think I'm crazy I don't care how you vote God's going to put a man there that's compatible with the hearts of the people in the nation the Bible says that but the promise that you are in the of God they are the ministers that doesn't mean you do everything they say. You might have to resist them. And we have examples in the scripture throughout the ages of how to deal with ungodly rulers like Daniel, you know, dealing with Nebuchadnezzar, who was humble, meek, and respected the authority and being from God, and yet at the same time stood for what was right. He was and, and so on. We, you know, Paul before King Agrippa. And um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, mm -hmm. oh, king, live forever. But yet, and still, we will not bow down. So we have that, those examples all through the scripture to respect mm -hmm. the authority and to respect human beings because they are the image of God. But yet, we have a God beyond their authority. We have a God who says, And not to rail against dignitaries. Not even against Satan. Mm -hmm. Mignon, you know? Mm -hmm. Rail against the, the power. Michael, the archangel, the yeah. captain of the hosts of the Lord, mm -hmm. would not dare rail against Satan. Right. But said, the Lord rebuked him. Mm -hmm. You know, I I know we're inclined in a far way, you know, even the Christians, and maybe I indulge a little, poke a little bit of fun at some of the leaders in government, but I don't think you should. They're there, once they get in office, they're subject to principalities and powers. They're subject to those principalities. That's why we pray. Amen. According to the mind of God, you can't you can't change the mind of God. But a people led in the Spirit will sense what God wants and can pray and thwart those principalities and powers. It happened during World War II many times. A praying people thwarted what Hitler was about to do. Changed his mind. Amen. And made him attack Russia instead of Britain. If he'd attacked Britain, the whole situation could have been different. And uh, God does that. And I, I, I'm looking for the time when there'll be a church, uh, a church in the earth and in this nation that is non-political. And I know I've read Charles Dawson's writings, and boy, he's against anybody. What are you going to do if this happens? And if this happens? And if this happens? Are you just sit, sit by and do nothing? I'm not saying do nothing. I'm saying I don't care what you do. You're not going to change anything until you have a vital relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then you can do anything God wants you to do. Yeah. That's, true. And that's a 
our problem. Not that we haven't got enough Christians around in, in governmental places. Because we don't have authority with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Amen. We, because we don't have that, well, we oh, we've got to get the right governor, the right president. And God isn't doing it. And God's shown the church in America. He's doing what he's going to do according to his plan. And that he's there because of the state of the nation. And therefore, and particularly the state of the church. Particularly because of the state of the church. So our burden should be in the state of the church and not always to think that the church out there and we're different, but you know, when you read Jeremiah, read Lamentation, we have sinned. Daniel says, we have sinned. We have disobeyed. We, a true prophet and a true priest of the Lord will identify himself with the people to whom he ministers. They have sinned. Well, Daniel didn't sin, but in his prayer, we have sinned. He, he's identified with them. So was Moses identified with the people. And... Uh, True priestly ministry is what God wants to bring forth where we will identify with the people. We're part of the church. I mean, I know we don't we can't find fellowship there, so we meet here, but God help us to know that He He's simply calling us unto Himself to be a priestly people who will be able to minister to our brethren. Yes, that's our love the Lord out there. It's not that we're something special. We're going to make it. We'll suffer whatever the church suffers. As the priests under God, they bore the iniquity of the people. Aaron went into the holiest of all. God said he would bear the iniquity of his people. And he carried them upon his shoulders and the, and the breastplate, their names. He, he went in there on their behalf. And I know we're all kings and priests unto God. But it doesn't mean that we're all functioning that way. And like I've been trying to emphasize, we read a scripture, oh, we're all kings and priests, fine. But there's more to being a king and priest than having the title. Nadab and Abihu were priests of God. They were sons of Aaron. Upon them would come the ministry of the priesthood. And when, Aaron, when Aaron died, one of them would become the high priest. They were priests unto God, along with Eliezer and Ithamar, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's four sons. God says they'll come into the holy place and minister unto me. But when Nadab and Abihu decided, well, uh, my father goes in there and offers up fire. We're priests. Let's go in there and offer up fire to the Lord. And they did. And fire came out from the presence of God and consumed them right on the spot. Oh, don't you just boast I'm a priest as if you can do anything you want. If there's anything that's significant about the priesthood is that they're confined and restricted. Far more so than the people of Israel. They're confined and they're restricted right. to the way of God and to the plan of God and to the purpose of God. Restricted to that. And, uh, and so fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them because the Bible says because they did, they offered fire which the Lord had not commanded. Simple as that. The Lord hadn't told him to do it. And so everybody in the church is a king and priest, and all the evangelists and prophets and apostles and teachers and pastors, they're kings and priests unto God, thinking they can do anything they want. No, because I'm an apostle, I can do this. I'm a prophet, I've got a right to do this. There's a higher ministry than an apostle, prophet, evangelist, Pastor, teacher, and that's the ministry of priesthood. And it's not another ministry. 
These ministries are supposed to be that. Whether you be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, the overall ministry of all God's people is priestly ministry and it's higher than those offices. And so it's wonderful when you see an apostle who's a true priest or a prophet who's a true priest. Ezekiel, a prophet who was a true priest. And, uh, he was a prophet, yeah. A priest. His concern was for the people. He wasn't out to prove that his prophecies were right. I mean, he just prophesied the word of the Lord. When I came, he prophesied the word of the Lord as God sent him to reprove Israel. And the man fell dead. Ezekiel was shocked and cried out to God for mercy. How many prophets would cry out to God for mercy? It scares me when I see some of these mighty men. I haven't seen him, but I heard about this man. Somebody was doing something he didn't like, and he says, For that, down he falls on the floor. Oh, the Christians say, what a mighty man of God. Where's the priestly ministry? He might have power. Where's the priestly part? And Moses said, Lord. And God said, I'll have to destroy this nation. It's all right, Moses. I'll still fulfill my word. I'll still fulfill my word. I'll make you to be the head of the great nation. And I'll make you to be a greater nation. <laughs> than Israel. I'll wipe them out and I'll make you to be the great nation. Moses wouldn't have it. He was an opportunist. Is that priestly heart in us? Is it in the leadership in the church today? He's failed, but <clears throat> I'll wipe him out and I'll exalt you. God, search our hearts. Yes, Lord. Look deeply within and uncover the secret motives, attitudes, and intentions of the heart. I believe that's why David was a man after God's heart, because he didn't only search his heart like you and I do. I search my heart, and this is what I find. But he says, God, search me and know me. Mm-hmm. Try me. And know my thoughts. Search me out, Lord, because there could be things there that I'm not aware of. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. God's after the heart. He's looking for the right heart. We're out looking for some way to enlarge our ministry, make it successful, make it to be approved, longing to be accepted, and longing to have power and authority, searching God for it, seeking God for it. Really, that's what I fasted and prayed for. I, because brought up in Pentecost, you're not Pentecostal until you have the power of God, and I didn't have it. I sought for power. Innocently, and yet I prayed even while I was seeking it, Lord, don't give me any kind of power or authority until you know I'm ready, able to receive it. I still pray that. And if necessary, let me die praying it. I don't want to have a power if I'm not ready to handle it. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You look around and you see people that have great power. And brother was telling me, and why, why is it? Use mightily of God. Tremendous miracles, a tremendous ministry, tremendous results. Yet, this happens. We don't understand it. I understand it. I think we should all understand it if we 
if we read the scriptures that having the power of God and having all the gifts of the spirit in great manifestation is does not make a man spiritual. Right. It can do the very opposite. It can do the opposite. Having a great manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God in our lives can do the very opposite of God's intention. It ought to humble us and bring us down and make us meek and lowly. If the heart is prepared of God, but if the heart isn't prepared, it can do just the opposite. It can build up pride, conceit, self, Establish the human ego. That those gifts from God can do it. You see, isn't every doesn't God send forth from his heart every good gift from himself? Isn't isn't it all good that comes from God? Yes, James says. But I'm talking about the effect it has on the unprepared heart. Hearts and longing for the rain, isn't it? Isn't it good? Yes. But what if there's a wrong seed there? Well, it won't affect that. Is that right? It'll cause that wrong seed to burst open and sprout and grow. The rain from heaven. God's precious rain from heaven. Will nurture the weeds, the tares, the thistles, as, as well as nurturing the wheat and the barley and the flax. I never saw that and I really got it because of something that William Branham said many years ago. Before he went out in the ministry, the Lord told him to go to a certain place and observe. And as he observed, the Lord pointed out a man. Vibrant, enthusiastic, praising God. He says to look at him, he was just like another brother that the Lord pointed out. Doing the same thing. He said they look similar. Very bright, vibrant, loving the Lord, praising Him, hands raised, whatever they do in Pentecostal circles. And the Lord said, this man's heart is right. He loves me. He's got a pure heart. That man's heart is totally clean. He found out it was so. Totally clean. God spoke to him about Hebrews 6, and I never forgot that. Hebrews 6. For the earth which drinketh in the rain, verse 7, that cometh off to punish, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, to receive a blessing from God. The earth drinketh in the rain, cometh off upon it, and bringeth forth vegetables, fruit, suitable for those, intended for those by whom it is dressed, which receive blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. And I hadn't noticed until I heard him say this that it's a result of the rain in either case. Is it not? Uh, you say, oh, God's blessing couldn't do that. It can. God's blessing can blind the heart. Because he's blessing me. 
I can talk in tongues. I can prophesy. I can heal the sick. I've seen it. I've seen it happen. And the Lord had named different ones. They had a mighty ministry. And their hearts were not right. And I'm not judging whether or not they repented in the end. Or, or if they were hypocrites from the start. I, I, I have to leave all that. But this one man, I, I had me visit in this church. I was there for a few days. And he'd be around laying hands on people and prophesying and get a big church, a couple of thousand people. And then I heard later that the things weren't quite right and I didn't know for sure, hoped it wasn't so. Finally, one man came to me and said, you get out of this city and never come back. If you come back, you'll be put in jail. He said, I mean it. And he had reason for saying that. The man disappeared. He knew what this was all about. The next thing I heard two or three years later, he was gone. One man, under 50 of them at the time. And it, it's, it's unbelievable, you know. And of course, we've heard of other things that's gone on. And we ponder it. How can that be? We shouldn't ponder it anymore. The rain comes down from heaven and waters the weeds that are there as well as the good seed. And our prayer should be like David. Lord, search me. Know me. Try me. That I might know where to pluck out these weeds that are growing. I might pluck up those thistles that are growing up. Those things that could ruin my ministry. Search me and know me. Try me. Know my heart. I mean, we don't like to pray that. Lord, try me. We feel we've had enough of it. But God wants to try people that he can bestow upon them fullness of his presence. That people will go forth in the image and likeness of Jesus. Jesus went down into the Jordan and John baptized him and he came up out of the water and John saw the holy dove descend upon him and, and remain upon him. So it wasn't just a passing experience, it abode upon him. The blessed Holy Spirit and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he went into the synagogue of Nazareth and opened the book where it was written in Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, to, unto the poor, to open the prison doors and set the captive free and so forth. But I didn't mention one thing and I purposely left it out to show that God had anointed and viewed him with the Holy Spirit that he might go forth and heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils and set the prisoner free and preach the gospel of the kingdom with power. But before God allowed him to do that, he drove him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And I don't hear much of that. And these great ministries that have come forth and I asked myself the, the reason uh, did God give them that opportunity did God want them to go into that wilderness did he give them did he make them to know that he wanted them to go into that wilderness or did they somehow just ignorantly get this great power and feel they didn't need the wilderness Or was God seeking to lead them there and they 
thought it was the voice of the devil. Because I've got the power of God now. The power of God doesn't do that. I don't know. I have no idea. But I do know that that's the reason they fall. The reason any of us would, would fall, could fall, will fall, if we haven't known the dealings of the Lord in wilderness experiences. Forty days and forty nights he was tempted of the devil there with the wild beasts. I believe they were literal beasts, but I don't doubt they were beasts of a satanic nature also that were running around trying to terrify him. And the tempter came to him. After 40 days, he was a hungry. The tempter came to him and said, Will thou turn this stone into bread? You're hungry? Take this stone. But you're the Son of God. You're hungry? Why would that be a temptation if a man's hungry and he hears a voice saying, well, <clears throat> don't you realize you've, you've got a gift of miracles? You could pick up that stone there and make bread out of it. <coughs> what's worse? What's worse? What's more wicked? Or is, would you say it would be wicked to turn a stone into bread? Or to turn water into wine, would there be any difference in it? Any difference, really? To turn water into wine for a wedding feast? Or to turn a stone into bread if you're hungry? I wouldn't see any difference in it. Mm -hmm. Then what was the difference? The Father did not tell him to turn the stone into bread. Mm -hmm. Nadab and Abihu offered up fire which the Lord commanded not. God hadn't told them to do it. The priesthood is under restriction to do only what God says. It was under that restraint. Confined. The priesthood is confined to the will of God. Confined to the sanctuary in the days of their ministration. Because they took turns in Israel. Ministration of the priest took turns. When the time came that there would be courses of ministry, I believe there's 12 courses in the year. And so their course was at a certain time, and they were, they were confined to the sanctuary. And somehow, the thought is liberty. Wow. If you've got power from God, if you're a priest unto God and you've got the anointing, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we pervert the meaning of liberty in the things of God as if liberty meant doing anything you want. <coughs> the liberty to do God's will, not to do anything you want. <laughs> Freedom to do God's will. I mean, we're we're finding difficulty in doing God's will because we we, uh, we search for it. I'm not sure, but God wants to bring us into a liberty where we'll be free to do what He says because we'll hear His voice clearly. So that was the test. You're the Son of God. Because I'm a Son of God, am I going to do these wonderful miracles? That seems to be the concept 
of what's going to happen when God manifests his son, they'll just, you know, they'll just overthrow everything in the earth. They'll just go forth in power and might and do, just wreck all the kingdoms of darkness and just, I mean, just devastating everything that's not of God. Is Jesus doing it in the heavens? King of all kings and Lord of all lords and all power in heaven and earth to do it. But God said, rule in the midst of your enemies. For how long, Father? Perhaps he doesn't know. He might know now, but when on earth he didn't even know when he was coming back. But the point is this. He has all power in heaven and on earth. But he knows he has to await the day of his power. And so for 2,000 years he's been ruling in might and power over the universe and over all nations. And I know a lot of people don't believe that. He's gonna, they believe he's coming back to Jerusalem to reign. And I read where he shall sit at the Father's right hand till all enemies are subdued under his feet. And that his feet is the church. And that the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation, but it's planted in the earth and grows. And at the end of the kingdom, he says, the end time is the harvest. The kingdom, the messianic kingdom, that they talk so much about, and that Jesus came to establish, was not delayed 2,000 years. He set it up when he has sent it into the heavens and set at God's right hand. Amen. He could have set it up on earth, and that's what they wanted. That's what everybody expected he would do. The people said, be glorious when he comes back and sets it up in the earth. He went away so that he'd have a power over the earth and over the heavens, because that's where our real problems are. Principalities and powers in the heavens. <coughs> The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand till all enemies are under your feet. Quoted from the New Testament or referred to eight or ten times as what happened when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named and hath put all things under his feet. Put all things under himself until the time would come when God would say subdue the last enemy which is death so that hasn't been subdued yet so we know that there are many other enemies that haven't been subdued yet but little by little through the church age there has been a, a manifestation of the power of the king of kings and who rules in the heavens Ruling in the middle of his enemies. Ruling in the midst of his enemies. Rule thou in the midst of her enemies. Well, we'll come to that right now. But the thing is, he had to learn obedience. He had to learn the voice of the Father. He wasn't here just, he didn't have this power just to do wonderful things. He was under constraint. He was a priest of God and he was under constraint to do the Father's will. He wouldn't turn the stone into bread because the Father hadn't told him to do it. He could have done it. But you, you see a great miracle. How could a man do a great miracle like that unless he had the power of God? Probably couldn't. But was he supposed to do it? Solemn thing. That God will give a man great power, and will give a prophet great power, and he can abuse that power and use it for wrong purposes. I had a talk with William Brown once, and he says, Now, my, mind you, he says, I'm just speaking to you as a friend and an older brother with you. He says, You've got to do what God says. He says, if any prophet tells you to do something, or he says, if I tell you to do something, you still got to know the voice of God yourself and do that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that a prophet can be wrong. 
And then he said something I've pondered over ever since. He said that Elisha was wrong when he cursed the young people that came out and made fun of them. But he shouldn't have done that. I don't know. But I mean, he was saying a prophet can be wrong. I mean, the greatest prophet of this century said a prophet can be wrong. I mean, and we know a prophet can be wrong. We know that Jonah was wrong. God corrected him. And uh, so God help us to know that the power he gives is not a release to use it as we will. That's why God is showing us these things because he wants to lay upon his church the full presence of God by which we can do anything God wants us to do, but unless our wills are so constrained and so brought under the dominion of the Holy Spirit, we ourselves will do wrong things to our own sorrow and to the sorrow of the church. We've seen it happen. Let's learn from what we have observed. Instead of wondering. How could it happen? Maybe they were right. I mean, God's given us understanding to know it's not right. To stand before the people and say, it's being recorded. <laughs> Send in this money. <laughs> Send in this money or God's going to take me home. I mean, Surely if we have a little bit of discernment, we know that God doesn't speak that way. If Christian people send in the money to keep it going. I'm not critics by God for businesses. God wants us to understand. In love, understand. Let us love him so much that we'll have true discernment. Because I discovered that love comes out of, out of love will come true discernment. So Paul says, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, which means discernment. I pray that your love will abound more and more in knowledge and discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent. Yes. Love. So let us pursue love. Let that always be our pursuit, no matter what other area we're talking about. Let the love of God be our pursuit. The real love. I don't mean a sloppy thing that, you know, nothing matters. Everything goes because we love. Because love is strong. Love is enduring, love is patient, love is kind. Love, love will lead you to discernment. And I couldn't understand that until I suddenly realized that you may approve the things that are excellent. That your love may abound more and more, that you might have knowledge and discernment, but be able to approve things that are excellent. Suddenly, I think, it came to me very simply. As we love God, and he loves us, and that's, that's what he means. Jesus prayed that, I pray, Father, that the love that thou hast given me may be in them, that they may be one. I've made known unto them thy name, and will make it known that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Mm -hmm. The love that wherewith you have loved me may be in them. So it's God's love. And, and Paul says, let that love abound more and more so that we'll be able to approve the things that are excellent, that we have discernment. What's love got to do with it? Well, if we have God's love, we... We have that heart of God. And we'll love what he loves. And we'll hate what he hates. Simple as that. 
Jesus loved righteousness and hated iniquity because the Father's love was in him. The Father's heart was in him. He loved what the Father loved. He hated what the Father hated. He had discernment to see them. When he saw the proud heart, because of the love of the Father in him, he hated that pride. When he saw evil, he was filled with God's love. Love hates evil. Loves righteousness. <coughs> And so, we can't go wrong. You can go wrong if you have a gift of discernment where someone says, that man's heart's corrupt. You can go wrong. I know a prophet that went very, very wrong because he was a prophet and he had that kind of discernment. And it awed people to think that he had that. First thing you know, he had a cult. He had total control over them wasn't for the fact they got in trouble with the law. It might still have been going, but but he was a prophet. His heart was not motivated by the love of God. Hardness. But a heart that's truly motivated by the love of God will have true discernment. So that when you see those things, some of which I've mentioned, I trust, I trust it will be received in the right way. I'm not trying to criticize, I'm just using an illustration. I'm not their judge. God will be the judge. But when I heard of things like that, and the power of this great prophet, and the attitude, I, I I just don't I don't find that relation. I can't I can't relate to it. And others can't relate to it. We don't want to judge. No, we don't. But let in love let's discern. Mm -hmm. That your love might abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment. In love. And if perchance the time comes, God sends you with a message to such a one, fine. But he's God's servant. He's not mine. And may there be love and compassion for those who we see may be going astray. And if God sees fit, go to them with a the word. But let love be the dominating thing. Because true love will sometimes be very harsh sometimes <laughs> get see behind me Satan he said to his beloved Peter because there was something there a temptation to avoid the cross Jesus knew it had to be and he told them I gotta go and die that's the wrong spirit there. Not you, Lord. No, you're going to be the king. You're going to reign. Get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. And so the temptation, you see, that the wilderness we have to go through to come to this place where God can entrust us to go forth. You see, I got the anointing now. I know Jesus had it. And he got the anointing before he went through the wilderness. He wouldn't turn the stone to bread. He took a man <coughs> to a pinnacle of the temple. He said, Cast yourself down. For it is written, He will give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus replied, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Cast thyself down. The angels will uphold you. Tempting God. I've heard preachers say, put God to the test. Mm -hmm. Do this thing that I'm telling you. Maybe it's a, an offering you want. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't have the money. Put God to the test. Write out a check for a thousand dollars and 
Prove God. Test him. The Bible says, Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. If he tells you to write a check for a thousand dollars, fine. You're walking in obedience. But you say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to test God in this. That's wrong. They tried to throw him over the hill when he came out of the synagogue. Nazareth was it? He just walked away from them. God protected them from them. They tried to stone him. I don't know what happened, whether they just bounced off him. It wasn't God's time. He was walking in the will of God. Nothing could hinder the purposes of God as a man walks in his will. But to go to the temple, because Satan challenged him, you know that much of the strategy of the church is built on meeting the challenge of the devil? He does something we don't like, we're out there to challenge him. At least to respond to his challenge. Are we supposed to be confronted with Satan? Yes. In God's will, in God's timing, in God's methods, by God's leading. I know David accepted the challenge of Goliath, but he was sent there in the will of God. His brothers were reproving him. He says, there's a cause. If they're not a cause, God has ordained that. Didn't mean from that day forward he had all the power of the kingdom to go and establish the kingdom for which he was anointed. In fact, the very sword he used to say, slay Goliath was taken from him. The very sword he had to slay Goliath was taken from him. But when he needed it, when he was ready for it, <coughs> when God's time came, he got that sword back again. running for his life, running from Saul, but he needed a weapon. And he went to the priest and he said, haven't you got a weapon here? He said, well, just the one you used to slay the Goliath with. He says, give it to me. That's nothing like that one. But it's been laid up there in the sanctuary for a long time. Be encouraged if you were used mightily of God once and now that doesn't seem to be happening, be encouraged. God's got any weapon you need laid up in the sanctuary, which you will receive in God's time, and it will mean more to you then than it did in the time of your youth when you were perhaps filled with pride and zeal and ready to go and get the job done. And you did one mighty work and everybody marveled and started to puff you up and God says no this I can't let David have this kind of ex exaltation because David was a man after God's heart whom he was preparing to be after his own heart whom he would send into a wilderness for many many years before he would be able to rule as a righteous and merciful king So he knew many wilderness wanderings. He had to go through the wilderness before he could manifest this kingly power. It's consistent with God's ways. Moses had to go through the wilderness. Joseph had to go through his wilderness. Before they were prepared vessels to, to use the power that God had for them. So you don't test God. You don't tempt God along the way. But recognize He will test us and He will tempt us. And that's His prerogative. But it's sad when we reverse it and test God. And that's what God said of Israel in the wilderness. You tested me and you proved me and you saw my works 40 years. They tested God. 
when God was testing them, they turned it about and tested God. God was testing them and withholding water and withholding bread and withholding some of the good things that he had for them. He was testing them in that. And in the error of their hearts, in the darkness of their hearts, they turned it about and tested God and said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Is the Lord among us or not? Have you brought us out in the wilderness to slay us? They were testing God when God was seeking to test and approve them to be a nation approved of God to go into Canaan as conquerors. Jesus wouldn't test God. Let Satan taunt all he wills. You say you're the son of God, throw yourself down on the mountain. That'll prove whether you are or not. You're God's son, the angels will uphold you. <coughs> Didn't test God. He wouldn't go by Satan's <coughs> instructions. He wouldn't try to meet the challenge of the devil. He would, Yes, he would in a sense, in God's way. He quoted a scripture which Satan had pulled out of context. He quoted the scripture that applied in that situation. The applicable scripture in that situation was not throw yourself down and the angels of God will look after you. The applicable, applicable scripture in that situation was thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Temptation 3. He showed the Son of God all the kingdoms of the world at a moment of time. All the glory of them. I read where one man said he, he had hallucinating dreams out there in the desert. No, this was very real. God subjected him to that. It was a test. It was a man. Fasting 40 days, very weak. We fail to understand that. We think of him as the son of God, you know, the devil couldn't, he couldn't possibly defeat him. But it was a real temptation, and we know in God's election, he couldn't fail, but as far as the situation was concerned, at that time he was vulnerable. God was approving his son. And he let Satan have the power to show Jesus all the glory of the kingdoms of men. And I don't think necessarily as it was then, but throughout until the end of time, he showed him the glory of the kingdoms. The glory that has caught away many of God's servants in the church, the glory of the world about us. He says, you can have it all if you'll serve me. You and I say, well, we wouldn't accept a thing like that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't go for that. And we don't think it a great thing that Jesus refused to. But it was a temptation. So I know that in his state of weakness and vulnerability, it is a real temptation because the Bible says he was tempted of the devil. If you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give it all to you. Here again, God had all the kingdoms of the world for him. And the time will come when Kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. But he was not to take it under the principles of Satan. Is it true or is it not that Satan is the prince of the powers of this, of this world? Prince of the earth. The God of this world. Is it true or not? You say it's usurped. We've got to take it from him. In God's time. In God's way. 
in union with the Son of God, in union with the King of Kings. Not because the challenge is there. If you'll serve me, I can give it to you. And I, I'm afraid many of God's servants have heard that voice and not recognized it. I'm afraid it has happened. I know a man to whom Satan came, and he said he knew it was Satan. And he said, I will make you to be the greatest healing evangelist in the world if you'll serve me. He says, I've got many servants in the church working for me. And I'll make you to be the greatest of them all if you'll serve me. That's his testimony, anyway. He recognized it as the voice of Satan. So it's a fearful time we're in. And uh, But when we mention these things, it's just that you and I might be aware it's not strange if God's servants are deceived by Satan. It's not a strange thing. Something that the temptation comes and they're not ready for it. As they lack the wilderness experience. Intended of the Lord to confirm our, our allegiance to the Lord Jesus, to know his voice so well, that open doors, nothing to do with it. Appearances is nothing to do with it. What seems right in the eyes of the church, or maybe your godly friend in the ministry, or maybe some great prophet or apostle might seem right to them. You and I have got to know that <clears throat> Because it is true, and I, I talked with Paul Cain, and I believe he's a true prophet of God. And I think he'd be quick to acknowledge that a, a prophet of God could miss God. I think he'd be quick to acknowledge that. He needs to be upheld because he's subject to a lot of advice and counsel from a lot of people, and rightly so, he brings it into fellowship. But we've got to know the voice of God clear enough that we're not going to be swayed by it.